welcome back to All Things Nature with Ranger Christine here at Boyd Hill Nature Preserve. Uh, this is a monthly talk about any and all things nature with a different topic each month. Uh, Boyd Hill is a 400 acre nature preserve in the heart of St. Petersburg, Florida. And our goal here is to help you get outside and on trails here at Boyd Hill and hopefully appreciating the beauty of natural Florida. So today we're going to be talking about a very special group of plants. I'm excited to get into it. So let's just go ahead and get started. So today's topic is epiphytes, life in the trees. Uh, but first of all, we need to decide exactly what epiphyte means. Uh, simple as I can put it, it's a plant that grows on another plant, but is not parasitic. Uh, these plants can include ferns, bromeliads, orchids, uh, and a couple other different types of plants. Uh, the ferns, bromeliads, and orchids are definitely some of the most common ones, but I'll also be showing you a couple of really interesting uh, 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 native species here that you'll find here out on the trails. So next time you're out at Boyd Hill or even at another preserve or park in the state of Florida, you could probably find these plants. You just have to look up because all of these plants are going to be living in the canopy on the branches of other trees. So it might take a little more uh, practice to find some of them, but once you get a good eye for it, it's pretty easy. So let's get to our first species. Now, most of us have probably seen this one before, Spanish moss. Talansia usneoides. It's probably uh, got one of the most fun species names out there. Now, what's ironic about this species is, of course, it's not Spanish and it's not a moss. <laughs> it's actually in the bromeliad family. And believe it or not, that means that it's actually really closely related to pineapples. May not look like it, but genetically speaking, they're very similar, very closely related. Now, not only do these look different from pineapples, but they also grow very differently from pineapples. So Spanish moss, as we all know, hangs down from the trees. It's, they especially love uh, live oak trees, uh, trees that grow in nice wet areas, things like that, but you can find it everywhere. Now, this plant can either reproduce through flowers and seeds, just like most other plants, uh, flowering plants, and you can actually see the very simple, very um, inconspicuous little green flower down here. And these come out in early summer. And once they are pollinated, they will produce a little seed pod full of little tiny seeds that are so light uh, that they actually float on the wind. And that's how those seeds are spread. But at the same time, Bromeliads are known for their ability to reproduce through producing pups. And pups are really just clones of the adult plant or the, the parent plant. And so this whole clump of Spanish moss here you see on the right side is actually a clonal colony, meaning that these are all genetically the same plant but they're technically individual plants all clumped together. They can grow off of each other and reproduce in that way. Uh, the other cool thing about this plant is its range. It's a really widely distributed plant and you can find it as far south as Argentina and as far north as Virginia. Uh, so really unique plant that takes nothing from the tree that it's growing on. Remember that epiphytes are not parasitic. Uh, and so Spanish moss takes nothing from the tree that it's on. It just collects dust off, uh, from the wind and of course rain and sunshine and that's all it needs. Uh, so it's a really cool plant. It's really tough plant. And uh, actually people have been using it for a bunch of different uh, uses throughout um, known history here in North America whether they're using it for bedding of some kind or stuffing uh, cushions or whatever. Uh, uh, people say that 
Henry Ford even tried to stuff the Model T seats with it, but it didn't do so great at that. So uh, it's a fun plant. It's got some fun history around it. And it's uh, ubiquitous here in the South. Next one, very closely related to Spanish moss, as you can probably tell, is ball moss. And of course, it's still not a moss. It's a bromeliad. Uh, and it can reproduce through flowers or pups, uh, but it, instead of growing in long chains, it'll grow into a ball form. So these guys will clump together, especially clumping around whatever um, uh, uh, base that it's growing on, whether that's a twig or a power line. Um, I've even seen these on the sides of buildings. So they have really great little tiny root systems that help them to cling on to anything that's got little crevices that it can uh, attach to. And just like Spanish moss, ball moss is covered with these tiny little scales called trichomes. Uh, and those trichomes is actually what makes this plant look silver and powdery. Um, these trichomes are there to help the plant absorb water, uh, to collect dust. Uh, it increases, they increase the surface area of the plant such that it can absorb the water and the nutrients that it needs straight from the air, which is a really nifty tactic for a plant that uh, doesn't ever touch the ground. Uh, so take a look or keep an eye out for ball moss. It looks a little, very similar to Spanish moss, but if you look pretty uh, uh, for a decent amount of time, you can usually tell the difference. Now, <laughs> While they don't look similar, this plant is actually in the same genus as ball moss and Spanish moss. This is the giant air plant, Tillandsia utriculata. Now, this is when you really start to see that uh, bromeliads uh, include the pineapple. Uh, this plant looks exactly like a pineapple growing on a tree. Um, of course, sometimes they fall off of the tree, and so you can see me holding uh, one that fell out of a tree with the big flower spike that it sent up. Now, there's two really cool things about this plant. Uh, one is that it's considered a tank bromeliad. Tank bromeliads, uh, when you're thinking of a pineapple or something like that, that's a tank bromeliad. They actually hold pretty large quantities of water within those rosettes of leaves that they have. Um, and so they can actually store a good bit of water for dry periods uh, in their leaves so that they can survive those droughts. Um, the biggest of these, uh, you know, these giant strap plants are named giant uh, strap plants or air plants for a reason. They can get quite large, uh, probably about three feet around. Uh, they can hold up to a gallon of water within their tank. So it's uh, quite a lot of water. Those giant air plants are, uh, or the big ones, can actually be up to 20 years old, or maybe even a little older. Um, and the, the plants can grow from 10 to 20 years, but then they flower once and then die. That's called being monocarpic. Uh, it might not seem like a great strategy for producing seeds, but in reality, these plants grow very slowly and it takes a lot of energy to produce seeds. So the strategy that they have is after years and years and years of building up enough energy storage to actually produce flowers and then seeds, they can produce these huge flower stalks that are up to four times as long as their longest leaf. And you can see me holding one here and you can see how tall that is. I'm about 5'5", five five, so you can have a uh, perspective there. And they produce lots of individual little small white flowers. Uh, but then when it comes time for those flowers to produce seed, once they're all pollinated, the biggest of these bromeliads can produce up to 30,000 seeds at a time. So while they're not producing seeds often, they can produce a lot of them. Uh, so they usually do have a pretty stable population. Uh, that's the that stable population is really good because these are actually really important plants for different critters that can live in the forest canopy. 
uh, whether it's green anoles or different frog species or lots of different bugs, a lot of these critters depend on these tank bromeliads uh, as a water source up in the canopy. It's quite dangerous for those critters to come down from the trees to find a source of water so they can instead just find these air plants and it's much safer for them. Um, what's uh, hurting these bromeliads right now actually is a combination of factors. First of all, good old poaching. Uh, a lot of people love to grow bromeliads and so sometimes they'll see some out in the wild and they'll take them and try to put them on their porch or something like that. And that's always bad for the population of the plant. Uh, and in, in this case, it's illegal because these plants are endangered. They're only found here in Florida and their populations are declining right now. So they are completely endangered and illegal to remove from the wild. Uh, of course, they're also dealing with habitat destruction like a lot of our other unique plants out there. But their biggest threat really is the evil weevil. This evil weevil is actually a weevil, which is a type of beetle that came in from bromeliads brought in from Mexico. And this is an invasive weevil. It has no predator here in Florida, and it is destroying most of our species of tank bromeliads here in Florida, which we have several of. Um, and so it's a good idea if you have these plants in your yard, maybe in your front yard trees, uh, to do a little research on the bromeliad evil weevil, do some reading on it, and keep an eye out for it. Because uh, if you find any bromeliads that have fallen because of that weevil out of their tree, it's always a good idea to make sure those go in the trash can so that those weevils aren't able to reproduce even more. So. Uh, real, this is one of my favorite plants here in the preserve, and you can still see a bunch of them out here on the trails, so keep an eye out when you're here next. So let's move out of the bromeliads and let's start moving into the ferns. The first fern we've got is actually a pretty small one. It's the resurrection fern, and uh, I like to think of this plant as the ultimate survivor. Uh, unlike most plants, which die if they lose more than about 50% of their water content, the resurrection fern can lose over 90% of the water within its tissues and still just uh, shoot back to life as soon as the rains come back again. And so you, depending on the weather, you'll either see these as mats of dry, brown, crispy looking little plants on tops of uh, big thick uh, limbs in a, a, a nice forest area, or you'll see it as this lush green carpet of ferns uh, if it's been nice and wet lately. Now, just like any fern, these don't flower. They actually reproduce by spores. And those spores are produced on these little dots on the underside of some of the leaves called sori. And they typically produce these sori in late summer. And so you can probably see some of those right now. And um, these are actually really important plants for a lot of the other epiphytes that live here in Florida because these can act as a pioneer species. Uh, pioneer species mean that it's a species that in some way produces conditions that are good for a lot of other species. And so these resurrection ferns can actually uh, produce a really good bed for a lot of our other epiphytes to start growing on. So they're a really great species to have around, and they're easy to spot. Our next fern is a bit bigger. These can get, oh, two to three feet long, maybe at the biggest. Uh, sometimes, uh, or most of the time, a little smaller than that. This is the golden polypody fern, which is a very fun name uh, that essentially means a many feet fern. The feet that we're referring to are actually the thousands and thousands of tiny little hairs that make up the root system of this fern. And they use that root system to grab onto the uh, outer boots or uh, broken off leaf bases, usually on cabbage palms. So for some reason, these really love cabbage palms and you'll often find them on that species of, of palm tree. It's also called sable palms. And you'll find these year round. They produce spores year round as well. Uh, but what's also cool about this plant is it produces its own insect repellent. Uh, it's called Polypodorian, 
And that's actually uh, a combination of polypody and orium, which is the species name for this. And uh, it's a really fun fern to have out there. And there's some talk about how native peoples use this fern, and I couldn't confirm any of them, but it might be worth uh, a little bit of research on your own. A uh, really cool plant, and keep an eye out when you're on our trails for it. Now let's get into the real beauties of the epiphyte world, the orchids. The first orchid uh, we have is the butterfly orchid. Encyclia tampensis is the species name. And yeah, it was named after the city of Tampa. It was actually first documented in Tampa. And so they named it after that city. You actually can find it throughout Florida, mostly in the South though, uh, and the Bahamas and Cuba as well. They flower in the summer, so we're a little late to see these blooms right now, uh, but they're absolutely beautiful. They're very small, but they're really, really colorful with usually that kind of golden brown in the back and the white and the purple in the front. Uh, these flowers are usually pollinated by bees and wasps and flies. Um, probably, they probably prefer to be pollinated by bees, uh, but the flies and the wasps might be a, a significant pollinator as well. Now, this plant, for all you orchid lovers, are they're considered commercially exploited, which actually means you cannot remove or sell these without a permit. So if you ever see these uh, uh, in, in your orchid circles, make sure that you're getting them from a reputable dealer with the license. Um, but you can see these out here at Boyd Hill. Uh, they might be a little hard to spot because the flowers are a bit small. But I like to say that if you bring some binoculars out, it's a lot easier. And uh, they're just such a treat to see. So I hope you guys can see them out here sometime soon. All right, this is our last plant, green fly orchid. Uh, this is probably going to be the hardest one to spot out here in the preserve because it's so small, it's so inconspicuous, and the flowers are actually fairly colorless, mostly white. But they're cool because they're actually the only epiphytic U.S. orchid that's found north of Florida. So these guys are actually found up in Georgia as well. Uh, every other orchid that it, it exists north of Florida is a ground orchid. This is the only epiphytic orchid that you find north of Florida. And they can be that far north because they're actually frost resistant which is not common in epiphytic orchids at all. They're usually very restricted to the tropics. So this is a very hardy plant. Um, they flower between May and October. So we might still have a few blooms out here in the preserve at, in Boyd Hill. Um, but again, they're a little hard to spot. So binoculars would be a really good option for trying to find these out here. And similar to the uh, butterfly orchid, the populations for the green fly aren't doing great. Um, they're threatened by habitat destruction throughout the state and, of course, over collecting. Luckily for this species, you do not need a permit. So if you do find them, it's a great one to have in your orchid collection. And uh, ironically, though, even though we have gotten very good at, at growing these in uh, captivity, we don't know what pollinates it. Um, we can make good guesses though. So we have a white flower with a long tubular uh, uh, bit in front that actually blocks off access to the nectar that's deeper in the flower. With any other flowers that we typically see that are white, they typically attract a nocturnal uh, pollinator. And that's because at nighttime, the color really doesn't matter. Um, uh, if you've ever gone outside you see a flower it's really hard to actually tell what color that flower is and that's same for a lot of the pollinators that we have now this tubular part also means that it's got to have a long tongue or proboscis or mouth part that can get down into that flower and that usually comes with a moth so our best guess about what pollinates this plant it's probably a nocturnal moth but we still haven't found it, and I kind of like that it's a mystery, but we'll still probably find it someday. All right, well, those are our six species. Uh, I hope you guys really enjoyed some of these that we've talked about today. 
uh, let us know what your favorite is down in the comments and come and join us next time for our uh, next talk with all things nature. Uh, thank you for joining and I hope you guys have a great night.